Hi, Dan. You work with customers who run Java on Google Cloud? Hi, Martin. Yes, I do. And many developers like running their Spring app serverlessly on Cloud Run. I use Cloud Run for all my new applications, uh, but I mostly write my services in Node.js or Python. Uh, I wish I knew more about using Java for that. Then let me share some performance tuning tips for Java developers using Cloud Run. So Dan, you're an app mod architect here at Google Cloud. Uh, what kind of work do you do? I help customers build high-performance, optimized, cloud-native applications in serverless environments, bridging the last mile between a platform and running workloads. Additionally, I contribute to open source projects within Google and the Java community. Sounds good. Uh, now, the last time I was paid to write Java was 20 years ago. A lot has happened in the Java world since then. Many Java developers use the Spring Framework uh, for new applications. Ah, right. I've heard good things about the Spring Framework. Another thing that's different is that there was no concept of serverless computing back then. Developers can use serverless computing to write and deploy code without having to worry about managing the underlying infrastructure, such as servers or storage. To illustrate, I have a realistic test application here, written in Java and using the Spring Framework. It processes image uploads. All right. Let's go to the Cloud Console. Open Cloud Storage and go to my storage bucket and then upload a file to it. This upload makes EventArt trigger the Cloud Run service, which is a Java application using the Spring Framework. Right now, the application is calling Google's Vision API to make sure the image doesn't contain violence, isn't racy, and so on. When that is done, it writes the image metadata here to Firestore. And here we see the result. It indicates in the metadata that the image is safe and lists the colors it has identified in the image. We can also see the application ran by going to the logs. I see the execution time there in the log. Uh, can we speed that up? Yes, whenever the application hasn't been used for a while, Cloud Run scales down to zero. The next time the service is invoked, it needs to be scheduled by the serving stack and a new instance of the app created. That takes some time. This is called a cold start. We just have encountered one. I often set min instances on my Cloud Run services. That way, Cloud Run never scales to zero. Well, cold starts happen when we scale from zero to one, like we just did. But they also happen if we scale from n to n plus one, whenever a new instance needs to be created due to increased traffic. So Dan, could I just set min instances to a value larger than I think I will ever need and not have any cold starts at all? Yes, you could do that. And for some customers, that's the right approach, but it will cost more. If you want to use auto scaling and pay less, it helps if your application starts quickly. I see. And that's where your performance tips come in? That's right. Cold starts performance is the sum of the cloud runtime environment, the Java runtime, the frameworks you're using, and your application code. Let's address each one of them. Okay. So let's start with the cloud runtime environment. Our cold start time was approximately 10 seconds. That's the number we're trying to beat. One nice thing about cloud computing is that we can add more resources at the click of a button. Let's add a second CPU so we get more processing power. I love how easy it is to adjust your runtime environment in the cloud. Uh, I wish I could do the same thing here on my laptop. Maybe one day you will. Here is what a log looks like after I uploaded the new image file and the service had another cold start. It now starts in 5.2 seconds, quite a bit faster than approximately 10 seconds. Nice. Can we add even more CPUs? Yes, we can. Let's add two more. When I run the service again and look in the logs, this is what I see. The start time is now four plus seconds. So it helped to add two more CPUs, but it doesn't help as much anymore. And we have to pay extra for those CPUs. Uh, they may only be needed during startup and not while the service is running, right? That's right. Cloud Run has a setting called CPU boost, which gives your service extra CPU at startup. But once startup is done, it goes back to the regular number of configured CPUs. How quickly does the example app start with CPU boost? 
As we can see here, the result is similar to running with two CPUs, but with CPU boost, we only pay for that extra CPU during startup. That saves us money. I like that. Any other tweaks we can make to the cloud runtime? I think we've done what we can here. Let's move on to the Java runtime. Right. Uh, I remember being able to set many options uh, when starting a Java program uh, back when I worked in startups. That's right. The JVM has many options. I can set them here in the console. These are the changes I found helpful to get started. Set the garbage collector explicitly. For example, set a parallel garbage collector. Set memory usage as 75% of the container's allocated memory to start. Inform the JVM about a number of actively configured processors and reduce the thread stack to 256 megs from the default one gig to save memory. Mm. And what's the result? When I ran with these options, the cold start time was around four seconds. We have more gains. Not bad. Uh, any other things we can do with the Java runtime? Well, we can sidestep the JVM altogether. Oh, uh, what do you mean, Dan? We can build a native image instead of Java bytecode. That native image will be a standalone executable. You'd compile your Java source code and get machine code for the platform you're running on. That will run faster and use less memory. What tools would you use to build that native image? You would use the GraalVM JDK. You can find out more at this web address. Here is what it looks like when I started a build. This command will compile the Java source code to a native image and create a container image that I can deploy to Cloud Run. And this is what it looks like when it's done. The image is on my local machine, but you may want to do this in Cloud Build, in Jenkins, in GitHub Actions, in your CICD pipeline. The build took four minutes and 40 seconds. All right, uh, this sounds great. Uh, should everyone build native images? Now, this is, isn't possible for everyone. For example, if your app depends on old jars, it takes longer to build, and it means your build will be specific to one platform, like Intel or Apple Silicon. But if your native images work for you, it can help significantly with performance. How much? Well, I ran a native image in Cloud Run and got a startup time of one second we can observe a drastic reduction in startup time. That's very good. I imagine we've done as much as we can with the Java runtime at this point. Yes, let's move on to the framework. OK, so by framework, you mean Spring? Uh, yes, and there are many web frameworks that help you build Java applications. While they make developers more productive, they bring additional latency because they need to load classes, do reflection, and so on. And they perform differently for different types of applications. So I imagine switching to a different framework can be a lot of work for the developers. It can be. It's a decision that involves a lot more than performance. You have to think about the skills of the team, for example. Right. Team performance can be just as important as application performance. Because there is so much going into your choice of framework, I won't go into much detail here, but I advise customers to consider these points if they're thinking of switching Java frameworks. First. Make sure you're using the latest version of your current framework and JVM LTS. There may be an update that improves performance. Estimate how long it would take your team to get productive with a new framework. Port one of your typical applications to the new framework and measure performance. Don't make a decision until you have these data points. That makes sense, Dan. Uh, now, the last item on your list was application code. Uh, what do you mean by that? I have seen many applications that load data into memory when they start, before they are ready to handle the first request. This time is added to the cold start time. Databases and networks can be slow. Even if you get the cloud runtime, the Java runtime, and your framework to start quickly, your application startup may make your service feel slow. How do you get around that? When I see applications that load a lot of data up front, I ask the developers if the data can be loaded differently. For example, can it be loaded from a cache or lazy loaded? Both are faster than a bulk load from a regular database. You could also try to minimize the container image, eliminating unnecessary dependencies. Avoid calling other services at startup and letting connection pools grow organically instead of creating many connections up front. 
And this is a bit of a mind shift from when I used to run Java code on an app server that I controlled. In the app server world, you would start your server, expect a longer startup time, therefore not be surprised for the time spent to load data before being ready to serve the first request. In a serverless world, your instances will come and go and will preload data more often. It brings you scalability at the cost of instances starting and stopping more frequently. Please configure your startup probes to allow Cloud Run to know precisely when your app is ready to serve incoming requests. Well, thank you for sharing these performance tips with us, Dan. Uh, what's a good next step for viewers who want to optimize their serverless Java apps? The best way to learn something is to get your hands dirty. I created a code lab that guides you through the steps we went through in this video. Sounds great. Uh, I will link to that code lab from the description. Also, remember the cardinal rule of performance tuning. Use your test environment to measure performance before you made a change and after you made the change. Only then make the decision whether to deploy the change to your production environment. Wise words indeed. Thanks for joining me, Dan. Thanks for having me, Martin. And thank you, everyone, for watching. If you have any questions for Dan or me, please let us know in the comments. Also, do let me know if there are any other serverless topics you'd like to see in future episodes. I read every single comment. Until next time!